Welcome to the Terrible Podcast with your host from SteelersDepot.com, where you can find all your latest and greatest Steelers news. It's Dave Bryan and Alex Kazora, always lit, talking Steelers. And now, here's Dave and Alex. Welcome to the Terrible Podcast, Season 13, Episode 100. He's Dave Bryan. I'm Alex Kazora, SteelersDepot.com. Thanks for being back with us here on this Tuesday night slash Wednesday morning, depending on when you guys are listening to this Dave and I recording on Tuesday night after a very busy Tuesday afternoon. And so it's only right that Episode 100 of Season 13 really marks a, a particularly eventful day for the Pittsburgh Steelers. Dave, there is, again, so much for us to cover. Yeah, uh, 100. Uh, that seems about the amount of posts that we've uh, written on the <laughs> site the last two, two days, right? Uh, a lot to get to in day two of the uh, 2023 NFL legal tampering period. And obviously, on Wednesday begins the start of the 2023 league year so it's going to be a busy day then probably a busy day the rest of the week i'm sure at some point they'll have the new signings talked in the media before the weekend's out so uh we're going to be busy dudes here moving forward here for the rest of the week and then i think it'll slow down just a tad i do want to talk about the clemson pro day in a little bit uh pittsburgh having a big contingency there but of course we have to start with some of the nfl free agency news and for pittsburgh there is a lot of it so we'll just go in order at least to the best of my recollection here on the moves that they that that, uh, came in here starting with an external signing and again things won't be official or can't be official until wednesday afternoon but pittsburgh reportedly agreeing to terms with offensive guard nate herbig on a two-year deal worth eight million dollars formerly of the New York Jets and also the Philadelphia Eagles has that Andy Weidel connection from their time together in Philadelphia. So that is the first movement along the offensive line signing Nate Herbig. Yeah. It sounds like uh 4 million guaranteed as part of that two year, $8 million deal, as you mentioned, and try to find where I have for a, a contract uh, projection here. Uh, looks like, uh, we don't know the exact numbers yet uh, on that, but I'm willing to bet the cap charge comes in around 3.1, 3.2 million, something along those lines there. So uh, a guy, uh, you know, obviously connections back to the Eagles, a Stanford product undrafted free agent from, from several, several years ago. Uh, I think he went with, uh, who was the guy he went with Joe? Uh, was it Douglas? I think uh, who went over to the jets or whatnot. Uh, Mm -hmm. Yeah, the GM of the Jets. Yep. Right. So, uh, uh, you know, they 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 snatched him for the 2022 season and he played that with the Jets. And, you know, from uh, from what we looked at as far as stats and all goes on that, you know, where he played positionally, most of his snaps in the NFL level have come at the right guard spot. Uh, He has, however, logged. You know, uh, 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 there's enough tape out there to look at, you know, when it comes to left guard uh, snaps for him. And I think somewhere just shy of 50 snaps uh, in total uh, for him. Uh, even at center. So you get a guy that can play all three interior positions. Obviously, center is probably not his uh, strong spot. I haven't looked at any of his left guard uh, snaps, but I did uh, this afternoon watch the what is deemed, I think, his best game, according to Pro Football Focus, last season, and that would have been against the Jets. And this is a uh, – a big dude, <laughs> uh, why a wide dude, uh, you know, even though he's what six, three, six, four, he's like 330 something pounds, uh, pretty good arm length on him there. But, uh, uh, I mean, he has no shape to him, uh, really, uh, he, uh has kind of one of those kind of squarish body uh, types. And when you read some of the things, the quotes to come out, you know, last year from like Robert Sala and, Connor McGovern, an offensive lineman, uh, they they call him Nasty Nate. And uh, if you're going to play for the Steelers on the offensive line, you know that you kind of look forward to to watching a guy that with the, with the nickname Nasty Nate. Uh, I think Sala 
uh, joked something to the effect that I'm, I'm not even sure he showers or, or you know, <laughs> something to that, that effect there. Now, uh, in that game that I watched from last year against the Bears, I didn't come away feeling, you know, this is just one game. Uh, I, didn't, I, I didn't come away from that game feeling that, oh, man, this dude's nasty. You know, mm-hmm. uh, I did come away with uh, uh, the feeling that this is a guy that I mean, Stanford product. You ought to be pretty smart. Right. Uh, uh, when, when it when it comes to you know, understanding, you know, schemes and assignments and all like that, he looked he looked very assignment sound overall as far as intent goes uh, there uh, able to get off the line. I, I think he gets off the line real well. I think he kind of explodes out of his. uh uh, uh, stance either with, uh, uh, with a hand down or, 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 you know, kind of that pass set, uh, uh, stance there. But, uh, I, I thought he got out real good and I think he gets to the second level real good. He can, he can definitely, uh, combination block and then, uh, not get stuck and get to the second level. I thought overall his balance, uh, was good. You don't see him, at least in this one game, you don't see him on the ground uh, much. There was one play later in the game uh, where he got kind of, he got thrown, thrown down, but Mm -hmm. uh, that was the only, the only time I saw that Uh, not on the ground much, Uh, pretty sticky overall. I think he uses his arms and his hands fairly well. Uh, I think he, at least in the game against the the bears, I thought he handled, uh, uh, games and stunts and spins really, really well, uh, overall. So I like that aspect. He seems to do a good job of knowing the, uh, you know, being on the same level with, 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 with the player to either side of him on some of those twists and stunts, uh, not not great change of direction by him. He's kind of one of those guys. He gets moving one direct. He he can fire out. He can get to that second level. But it's not like you're going to ask him to run a forty yard dash or anything. And it, it's going to def. It's a definitely a mismatch with him if he gets out on a defensive back and gets their hands on him. And for the most part, I think he do, does a good job of handling linebackers if he can get off clean to uh, to the second level. Occasionally he'll slip off uh, there, but uh, a physical guy uh, all. To together. Uh, but once again, I didn't come away from that one game thinking, oh, I see why they call him nasty Nate, you know, that, that kind of thing. So I think he's a competent interior line guy, a guy that should be able to compete. It'd be interesting to see where the Steelers play him. Right. You know, cause he was a right, mm-hmm. right guard, mostly a right guard guy. And obviously the Steelers got James Daniel, uh, uh, uh at, at, at right guard there, you know, uh, our, you know, I haven't watched his left guard tape. Maybe you've watched a little bit of it. So w- what are your thoughts on him? Yeah, I'm only one game in. I started with the Steelers game last year just because it was something that I'm sure was, you know, top of mind for Pittsburgh. And I saw that physicality and nasty and even just early, some of the set the tone snaps early in the game, you know, I think pissing off Larry Ogunjobi with some blocks he was finishing. And so that'll be some maybe potentially fun training camp, uh, camp matchups in the summer with Ogunjobi. Coming back, we'll talk about that here in a second. But I expect Herbig to be at left guard. I know he's not played there quite as much to get the exact numbers, according to PFF, throughout his regular season career. 377 snaps at left guard, 49 at center, and 1,648 at right guard, including a lot of right guard action with the Jets this past season. I think he might have had some left guard work as well with New York with Vera Tucker. I think he kicked out the left tackle or have to go back and kind of investigate that more. But I certainly saw some of the physicality and nasty in his game, running his feet, finishing his blocks. You're right. I mean, he's not, the foot speed isn't great out on screens, out on space, but he's got some bursts. And when he pulls mm-hmm. and traps and some of the second level, he can climb and stick and he's so big, he can really engulf and, and get the job done. So I don't think he's a terrible athlete, but he's not going to be obviously some, you know, Teron Armstead or Trent Williams type of guy, Jason Kelsey type of guy out in space like his framework overall like the attitude that's going to be emblematic of the Steelers system that should be a little more open than what it was this past year but certainly they want to run the ball they want to play physical football um you know duo blocks and create that first level movement that's going to be key I think Herbert can do that well as you said picking up stunts and twists and games really heady guy technically sound um uses his length well and he's got that those heavy hands and under Pat Meyer you want to have that first significant contact and pass pro get a good punch he can refit his hands does a good job to anchor and stall because he's so big in that lower half. He's just so massive. He's got that you know, really good power that he can really anchor down and shut down power rushes. But 
um, to, to where he'll play. You know, the, the tweet uh, when the announcement was made that he was signing was that uh, Andy Weidel, the Steelers, envisioned him, envision him as a starter. And so I assume he's got the upper hand on Kevin Dotson. They may frame this as a competition between Dotson and Herbig at left guard, and that's probably the way they'll, they'll do this. But I think as of right now, it's uh, Herbig's uh, job to lose. At $4 million per, you would think so, right? You know, kind of uh, uh, reminiscent last year when they signed uh, Cole, right? For, right. Uh, uh, you know, you, you're really going to, you know, yeah, you'll frame it one way. And I'm sure Tomlin and all them will say, look, you know, nobody's won nothing yet. That, that kind of thing there. But I, I think you go into this hoping that you got a guy that can that can be a starter on that offensive line there. Uh, you're not going to pull him 10, 12, 15 times a game, I don't think. But uh, he is a guy that so you can uh, 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 definitely pull. Well, he, he pulled like two or three times, I think, uh, right to left in that game against the Bears. Uh, he pulled to his own side and some pin and pull stuff. And he, he really looked to do a good job on that and uh, seal off the, uh, the edge guy and make contact in there. So, uh, yeah, look, I mean, he can, he, you know, in my notes here, I, I've got that he can get off the ball quickly. Uh, he can get out into space quickly. And uh, he can get his you know, he can get his hands on people, too. And he usually gets off even on some of those combo blocks and probably due to maybe kind of that sh- that sh- even though he's 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 what, six, four or something. He's, mm-hmm. he's got more of a squattier feel to him, you know, uh, kind of plays more compact, I guess, than his overall uh, size would indicate there. And maybe that's a good indication of him doing a good job of keeping his, uh, uh, you know, not standing up, you know, trying to, and, and I think that also plays into the fact that he keeps his balance pretty well overall. So, uh, you know, I guess now the question, you know, we'll just watch and see where he ends up playing supposed to be supposedly to hear all the comments. He's a good locker room guy and yada, yada. And once again, a Stanford product. So, uh, I, I bet he can, that he can diagram some sentences and, and do better math than I can. But uh, uh, four million per, I I would willing willing to bet that they think he could be a starter. Yeah, and the money's totally fine. That's not a high price to pay um, given the O line tax that you see with some of these offensive linemen out there. So the deal to me is totally reasonable. And you know, I've talked about all season that if you were going to try to address one spot upgrade on this offensive line, if you could only pick one, it would be that left guard spot because to me. Kevin Dodson is the more talented player. In some ways, he's got a similar body type and style as as Herbig in the sense of that, you know, big, physical, nasty guy. Dodson's more athletic, though, but it just has never come together with his game. The penalties, inconsistency, <laughs> uh, playing technically sound on their Pat Meyer system. It just has been a frustrating time. It got better the back half of last year. I do want to give him credit there, but, you know, it just has not come together the way that you hoped or expected it would. So at the least, it's going to really put a fire under Dotson, or at least it should, because A, he's in a contract year, and B, you have a real serious contender in Herbig. Last year, there was that quote-unquote competition between Dotson and Green. That was never a competition. Dotson's going to win that job, barring something disastrous occurring. And so that should really refocus Dotson. Um, But I still think Herbig's got the the edge right now. Now, in terms of the downside, you know, he's going to have to deal with that Pat Meyer system and, and change those more aggressive on body sets. And he's not the best laterally. I watched uh, Hogan Joe be, be able to, to beat him inside on one rep and, and uh, Herbert couldn't seal and his feet kind of stopped on his punch and uh, he lost his gap. And so how do you handle those aggressive sets? I think he'll win a lot of those quickly because he is so long and strong and physical with a, a good punch. But when he loses, how well can he recover in those moments? that's going to be the concern for him. So that's kind of the one thing I'm really going to watch starting in camp, but throughout the season. Pro football focus tells me that, uh, 2020, uh, the game against Dallas in week eight was his best game at left guard. So how many starts does he have at left guard? Can you find that information? I assume he's got four, five, uh, in, 2020, I can tell you he had one, two, three, four, five, looks like five starts uh, in 2020 at left guard. Uh, 2021, as far as starts go, zero. He did play at left guard, but came in uh, as a backup in in those games, it looks like. Uh, last, year, last year, he just played pretty much right guard, didn't he? 
Yeah, he only played. Okay. Uh, he started every uh, every game that he played. He started at right guard, and then I guess what uh, two thousand? Excuse me, nineteen didn't play much at all. Uh, okay, so five starts at left guard all yeah, in twenty twenty. Okay, right. gotcha. Um, and, yeah, what was he at again, Stanford? Do you know what he was at Stanford? No, I haven't. I haven't made it that far back uh, to him yet. Uh, I guess we could try to pull his bio and see if there's yeah. a- anything in that. It's kind of hit and miss whether or not they tell you. Uh, if he looks uh, like it might be left guard. I think I'm seeing something there. We'll have a full breakdown from Josh Carney on Wednesday morning on Herbig. And so he'll have the, uh, the full film room for you guys to check out at as a junior in 2018 played six games at right guard and one at right tackle. Uh, doesn't tell me as a sophomore where he played in 2017, 2016, six starts at left guard, according to his Stanford bio. I would have to, I don't have, uh, my PFF college. I'm just looking at his jets bio right now. Uh, freshman, six starts at left guard, sophomore 13 at right guard, junior, he played right tackle and right guard. So has not done a lot of left guard, especially right. in recent years. But if, if that's going to be his position throughout the offseason, the summer, the preseason, he should be well acclimated by then. He has some NFL experience there. And like you said, a Stanford guy, smart guy. I don't think it's going to be a big mm-hmm. issue. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can't uh, make a note to go watch that Dallas game because that's evidently his best game, according to PFF, uh, week eight uh, of 2020. Man, that's been a couple seasons ago, though. But uh, <laughs> It has. Uh, we might have to I have to dig to try to find that one where I got it somewhere. But anyway, now the, the loser of this battle, we'll call it a battle between Herbig and Dotson, will create that solid depth at least at guard. Now, if Herbig became the backup for whatever reason, he can play some center. Dotson, you could try him there, but really, he'd be an emergency type guy. And James Daniels would be more apt to, to move to center if you had to uh, than Dotson would. But at the least, Dotson would become. A, a quality backup at left and right guard. And so we talked about how the starters, there's a debate about that, but certainly depth, there's nothing there. Still have to work on depth. There's nothing at tackle right now. And you could draft somebody at 17. That may make more swing guy conversations for later in the off season. But at the least, this move will hopefully improve starters with Herbig and improve depth as well. All right. Does this take out guard early in the draft? It's a really good question. I'm kind of, I'm kind of thinking so. Or or does it give you the ability maybe to draft a center? It's usually of a- those guys, when you draft them high, they're playing right away. Yeah. Whether it's, it's offensive linemen, usually those guys aren't aren't sitting too long, um, especially for Pittsburgh. So I don't want to rule anything out, you know, here in, in mid March, but well, as we talk, I- this 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 guard class, true guard class overall is not not all that great. And that's probably why some of these sure. guys got the money that they got in free agency, right? What do you I call think that it? happens every year. Tax yeah. or- the offensive line tax, yeah, just just every year the scarcity is is is, is pretty scarce, so to so, so to speak. So, um, yeah, yeah, I just think about my John Michael Schmidt's dream might have taken a hit today. <laughs> uh, they do have Osiris Osiris Torrance evidently coming in. We mentioned that I think uh, last night, but uh, that might be one of those break glass in case of emergency. Kind of let's get to know this kid and you know if, if everything else is off the board, kind of thing. At, at yeah, one of those. Day. We'll see you after your rookie deal with right. Osiris, and then right. we're going to come calling, um, a la uh, James Daniels or Nate Herbig. So. Um, either way, I think a good signing overall, um, you know, we'll have to see how that system fit is, but certainly the identity of what Pittsburgh wants that nasty physical ground game first type based offense. I'm guarantee you Andy White on knows a lot about him. Yep. Yep. And so there's certainly a connection there and you kind of feel that, that Weidel trench guy, you know, Weidel was a guard in college. And so he loves those big, those big guys up front. And so it's a, it's a smart fit all around. All right, so you say there's some na- there there's some nasty Nate in that uh, game against the Steelers, then? Yeah, I thought so, and I think Josh will talk about that some in his report. Okay. So I mean, it's not anything where he's you know Michael or the blind side putting a guy in the third row, but you see the finish, you see him on top of guys, kind of getting in guys' heads. Uh, Ogan Joby early in that game, later in the game on Montrevious Adams, just on top of him and just laying there and just you know just kind of what's the old uh, Ron Cherry phrase, giving him the business. There's a lot of that <laughs> on Nate Herbig's team. Uh, all right. All right. So the Herbig news came in. And then right after that, these things come in too is apparently the news that DeMonte Casey was going to resign to uh, to come back to 
the Pittsburgh Steelers. And so Casey on a two-year deal reportedly don't know money on that yet, at least as far as I'm aware, but Demonte Casey seems destined to return to Pittsburgh. Yeah, no, no figures on that, that yet. Nothing uh, guaranteed total value, nothing that I've seen so far. Uh, would you Which generally su- means it's probably pretty low, right? If an agent's right. not pushing that number out. But, but would you be surprised maybe if this, this, this deal matches the deal that Herbig got? I think, I, I could two, be wrong. Years, I, I've eight, been eight missing on this. I feel like it's going to be lower than that, just given the safety market, the age. Um, I don't. I don't know for sure. I mean, you're right. Pittsburgh's done a lot of two year eight million. Didn't Wallace and Witherspoon get mm. two years eight million too? So I can't. Kind of seems to be the number Pittsburgh's rolling with. I, I'll guess it comes in a bit under that, but okay. I've been wrong before. All right. It, uh, around, okay, around there, right? Three and uh, three and a half per maybe. Yeah, I'll, I'll take a guess and say three, but we're splitting hairs. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, uh, look, uh, they had to at least bring one of these guys back in Casey and Edmonds. And at least uh, uh, Casey gives you a little bit more versatility. Uh, we raved about him last year and in, in, uh, or at least, you know, uh, uh, you saw him during camp. And then obviously you know, I got to see him in preseason and really impressed as a as a hitter. And uh, unfortunately, missed the first half of the season, came back and, you know, instant impact right away. and. Uh, yeah, I thought he really represented him, himself really well in the games that he did play in uh, last season there. So you've got a guy that's versatile overall, uh, and they, they had to at least bring one of these 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 guys back. And we'll see what obviously happens with Edmonds in what looks to be a crawling safety market once again here. Uh, and may, maybe maybe Edmonds is headed for another one of those four-year <laughs> Uh, four-year veteran benefit contracts might maybe might be the thing that puts the most money in his pocket again, you know, but uh, uh, there's nothing not, I mean, obviously we'll have to wait and see what the, what the money says, but uh, to me, there's nothing not to like uh, about the re-signing of Casey. It's something that I felt that I feel that you had to do at least with one of these two with the edge going to him, if you could get him. Especially after losing Cam Sutton. Now we'll have to see what Casey's role is. In theory, could it be a starting strong safety next year? You know, that, that's possible. Um, but when you lose a really versatile piece like Sutton, you're placing with a Patrick Peterson who's going to be, you know, less versatile, less flexible than what Sutton was. You needed somebody that brings some of that that's likely to make your team. Now Trey Norwood can do a bit of that, but again, he's got a his roster spot is not secure next year. Casey's a guy whose spot's going to probably be a lot more secure and he can wear a lot of hats. Hasn't played a ton of true slot corner, but he can roll down. He can play, uh, you know, came in in dime packages last year. He can play either safety spot. You can have more uh, free safety rotations with him playing that post defender than you can Terrell Edmonds. He's a guy with natural ball scales, ton of interceptions in his career, two picks last year in that back half of the year with Pittsburgh, including one against Deshaun Watson. So um, Edmonds was a guy that's more limited. He's got a, you know, he, what he does, he does pretty well. That classic box safety was really kind of used as a dime linebacker in those six DB packages last year when Casey became the safety and they kind of ran more stuff rotations with, with him there. Um, so Edmonds really isn't a guy that can play that deep center field Casey can. Right. And so um, I think Casey can do some of the things Sutton was doing on third down with some of those post snap rotations um, that obviously he won't do now that he's in Detroit. So I think it was, Important to get at least one of those guys back just in general, obviously, but then I think doubly so once Sutton left to, to keep somebody who's got that flexible skill set, that chess piece like Demonte Casey. Point Kazora. <laughs> <laughs> no, what do I, I win? No, I, I, you know, yeah, you, 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 hit it, you, you hit it right on the nose there. And uh, uh, look, you got a guy, too, that's been in that defense for a half a season, so he knows what's going on. So you don't have uh, – you know, you're already losing Sutton in there, and you're going to have Patrick Peterson coming over, and he should obviously be able to pick things up uh, fairly fairly quick. So uh, not – you know, you, you wanted to, to avoid as many uh, changing of moving moving pieces and parts, you know, as much as you can uh, with this – with this with, with a chunk of this defense coming back in uh, 2023. So – uh, I give it a, I give the signing a 10 or I give it a nine until, uh, I, I see the numbers. Right. Now, let me ask you this. You were confident Casey Edmonds were likely to return or had a good chance to return Casey back. Has your confidence or thoughts wavered at all on Edmonds? Do you think he still comes back or do you think this could be a sign that he's going to go somewhere else? Yeah. I mean, great question. I mean, I, what's, what's the market going to say to him and, and how bad does he want to go? You know, uh, 
I mean, obviously with Casey being the first one back in the door, I, I would think that hurts Edmonds chances, you know? Sure. Uh, now can Casey, not, can Casey, I'm not be that seeing st- a number, you know, on him because mm-hmm. remember last year, uh, Casey was a, a vet benefit, uh, contract. It's not going to be a vet benefit contract this time around. So you're going to have more money invested in him. Uh, you know, la- last year he was more of a, what do we have here? Now right. you know what you have there and you're going to play it. Now, is he going to be the strong safety week one, the starting strong safety? I think that fits a little not perfect for him. If that's sure. The plan. Sure. And and maybe that that's a point to uh, a good reason to maybe try to get Edmonds back. If you look, they're not going to go overboard to re-sign Edmonds, plain and simple. Uh, in fact, his, his, his max, I mean, here's the bad thing. I, I really wish we had the damn Casey numbers mm-hmm. uh, here. Cause you know, it would be easy right now to say, well, just, just give them the same deal. You know, you, they gave Casey, but we don't know the numbers, you know, yeah. so, or if Casey was getting four and a half million, then, okay, he's probably starting in some capacity or he was getting one and a half million. That may say something about what his role is expected to be. Right. And I would think Edmonds would want to return if possible. But once again, if he's, uh, if you're talking about another one year deal and him probably not going to be able to, uh, if it, if it ended up being a four year, you know, what they call the four year veteran benefit contract, which is a one year deal, uh, it might put a little bit more money in his pocket, but how much would he help his market value, uh, in playing time, barring injury? Maybe he just wants a fresh start and say, I can go get a one year deal elsewhere and play a little bit more. Maybe I, maybe I increase my value. So I think to, uh, got away from your question there. Uh, in the broad look at this thing with Casey back in the door first, yes, it does decrease the chances considerably, probably cut, probably cuts them in half of uh, Edmonds coming back. But in the same breath, we don't know what's going to happen with the rest of this market. We don't even know what, 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 what the numbers are on Casey. I won't close the door on the chance Edmonds returns. I can see the fit there. If he becomes a starting strong safety in case he returns to that dying chess piece, you could try to make it work. But I had that thought pre the start of free agency that one, only one of those guys would come back. And at this point, Edmonds have kind of played this. We're kind of in, but we're not really committing. And at some point, Edmonds is not going to play 10 years in Pittsburgh. Eventually you move on. I think it's probably a good move on spot right now. So I'll stick with the prediction that he goes. I don't know where he's not going to get a lot of money, obviously for the reasons you mentioned. Um, And and, and assuming for a second that he's gone again, does Casey really become your starting strong safety with that body type? I know he's physical. He plays downhill. He plays bigger than his size, but you know, he's a pretty small guy. Edmonds was in the box 35% of the time last year. Can Casey do that? Uh, There's a question there and also a question of even if Casey is your starting strong safety, who's your 6 DB right now? Is it Norwood? Is it somebody else? So I still think there's work to do there. I'm not sure if it's Edmonds, um, but I am happy Casey's back to give you an option to give you some flexibility. Somebody who won't be coming to Pittsburgh is cornerback Byron Murphy. He uh, Vikings are working to finalize a deal with him. Is there a Uh, number on that yet? uh, No number yet on that. It doesn't probably going to be decent number on that but um yeah pittsburgh liked him coming out of washington i think they had a visit with him and some people thought if you lost sutton could murphy come in obviously when he peterson more of got his own signed. guy though uh any murphy i think but peterson has always kind of been called recently more of his own guy but either way once peterson inked then you kind of knew murphy was not gonna not gonna be an option um oh you when, i i you know in your reports and all and i guess you get a little bit more film you 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 saw what i was referring to late last season with uh peterson more of the boundary guy right yeah, it was interesting, and it, it it's, I kind of have a little egg on my face because as soon as I, I no, said that, no, I went back no, and watched no. it. We each only watched a little bit of time, but it just goes to show you that you that you can't just – you just – depending on what game you choose, you better go find other games, right? I mean, if, right. if, if anything, that's a testament that you can't draw hard conclusions from one game of tape. I picked the game that it you know, just so happened to be that he was uh, a, you know, a, a primary brown boundary guy. Well, it seems like to me he was playing that the back half of the year because you watch the Vikings game against Pittsburgh two years ago. He wasn't strictly a boundary corner. You watch early in that uh, in the Vikings season in 22 it wasn't just a boundary corner. The last two games I saw later in the year, I think against I want to say Green Bay, maybe the Giants or somebody else um, he was playing and, and not only boundary as an outside corner, but the literal boundary, the close mm-hmm. side of the field. And so my concern there is that they're that they were watching him throughout the year and said, this guy's lost a step. 
we're going to try to reduce the amount of space he has to cover by making him a true boundary corner. And is that a concern about that when you come to Pittsburgh that doesn't typically play boundary field? They play sides through the left corner near the right corner back. And so they actually kind of have a bit more concern there seeing him as a literal boundary corner because the boundary, it's not like college where you have kind of a more true boundary because the hashes are wide right. NFL, the, ha- the hashes are more narrow. It's considerably less, of a difference. less. Yeah. Yeah, you can be a true boundary corner and, you know, Sauce Carter played the boundary in Cincinnati and just took that that side away. That's uh, harder to do in the NFL, but I'm still concerned about that because something I think told the Vikings, we got to try to reduce the space that Peterson has to cover. And I'm worried about that as he goes okay. another year older. Okay. We got uh, but, plenty of time to research more yeah. film on that. And, and, and Owen's probably going to be doing something on him pretty soon, right? Yeah, I'm sure Owen will pick up something on on Peterson, kind of our our, our DB expert of the uh, Steelers Depot team. One guy that is coming back to Pittsburgh is Larry Ogunjobi. And I guess you want to call it one of the two maybe surprises of the day, not just the fact that Ogunjobi is returning. That's not a shock, but the number to me was pretty surprising. And so kind of walk through the numbers, if you could, Dave, on uh, the three-year deal that Ogunjobi just signed or is about to sign. Yes, uh, a stout deal for a stout man, right? Uh, mm-hmm. uh, I gotta be honest with you. I, and look, uh, he was one that I thought, you know, mercenary, mercenary Ogan Joe be probably going to go, go, go for the most money wherever he can get it. Uh, I'm convinced that Pittsburgh was the most money now, uh, uh, three year deal totaling out according to Adam Schefter at 28.75 million, uh, 21.75 of that through the first two years, there we don't have anything as far as any other numbers other than that but i can tell you this the uh the now his totals out at 28.75 uh the three year deal almost a year ago that uh, uh that uh Chukwomo Kora for uh almost forgot to say how to say it's been so long since i've said Chukwomo Kora for i almost <laughs> forgot how to say Chukwomo Kora for uh his three-year deal a year ago totaled out at 29.25. So uh, it totaled out at a half a million more last year than what Ogan Joby's uh, reportedly totals out at. However, comma, uh, Ogan Joby's getting 21.75 through the first two years. Whereas a core four got 20.5. So what's the difference in that? 1.25 million more through the first two years of it uh, there. So uh, he's here's what I envision. And once again, we don't have the numbers on this, but this contract, I, I can almost, I don't, I don't like to speak in absolutes here, but it, I can almost guarantee you it's going to look very, very similar to the one Chiquama Corfor signed. Okay. And, mm-hmm. and probably that includes a roster bonus in both 2024 and 2025. Uh, even down to that, uh, we don't know the signing, signing bonus yet. His cap number is going to come in probably anywhere from 4.3 to maybe 5 million on this uh, I personally and this it, this isn't worth anything but uh, I personally had him pegged at a max value per year at seven million dollars okay he made okay. eight million last year uh you wanted more out of him last year I felt uh, overall uh very up and down kind of player you know obviously the production not 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 what you what you thought maybe you could get out of them so i kind of dinged him for that i dinged him a million dollars off of his last year value for that and i had his max value at seven million now uh his deal uh with uh with the steelers if if we take take what you know adam Schefter reported as as the gospel comes out to nine point five eight three 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 uh million there so uh, I consider this a bit of an overpay, but you know, is this a was this a defensive tackle tax this year? Mm-hmm. You know, was it a yeah. supply and demand uh, situation? Because the one thing we I did say leading up all this is how long you know, looking at you know pre 
tampering period with the, some of the guys that looked like they were going to be off the market, even though Tomlinson he ended up hitting the market. Uh, how long was it going to take for 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 Larry Ogan Joby to be the biggest fish left in the pond? You know, sure. and and that happened fairly quickly. I envision, and I'm this is 100 speculation on my my part. I'm willing to bet. Ogan Joby had another suitor or two out there and the Steelers had to, had to, had to pay the tax on that. And they were kind of in a corner. You lose Ogan Joby, your room's looking really empty. The draft has a couple of names, but it's hard to find those types to fit Pittsburgh. Well, and you could go external for agents, but then there's the unknown of the external guy and hoping that he works. Um, I imagine though, that, Ogan Joby's contract is the most of anybody that had one and a half sacks last season as a three tech. I don't know if there's any three tech getting paid as much as he is from a, a sack standpoint. Not that we're, be, we're uh, beholden to that number alone. It's just one number. It's not always indicative of a play, obviously, but um, it is interesting that he got paid eight million this past year after a seven sack season. Now gets paid on average, you know, 9.5 after a one and a half sack season. It's just kind of funny to see how that works. And I understand there's health and that's. There's reasons for for all of that to some extent. Uh, to me, I mean, as you said, he, he's a he's a hot and cold player. His tape is very hot and cold. He's a talented guy. He certainly flashed. He had some really high impact plays. Can he stay healthy? Can he be consistent? Th- those are the concerns there. And I have concerns about the health. He had the foot injury two years ago. He battled toe injuries this past year. Battled knee injuries this past year. Didn't always practice. I think that certainly probably impacted this play. He's getting closer to thirty. I'm just worried about his body breaking down. If he can be healthy and be consistent, he's a talented guy, certainly a worthy starter. He won't be a bad contract, but I'm worried about this guy just kind of declining as he gets closer to age 30. Now, look, you need more, you, you need, you need better play than last year out of him. Consistent, please. I mean, the highs are good when the highs right. were there. I mean, and obviously that's not have to be perfect. More, okay. But, more consistent play. Yeah. Just less, less valleys, you know, keep the peaks and be a little more consistent and, and I'll be happy with that. Look, this isn't okay. We can terminate however we want an overpay or whatever. Uh, they something had to be done, <laughs> uh, whether it be bring in somebody else from the outside or you resign him, uh, mm-hmm. going ahead of the draft, right? Because we, yes. we, we, we've both admitted that this draft class, you know, uh, especially for what the students look for, isn't all that deep, right? So, Can I interrupt you for just one ahead. second here? I apologize. I saw some numbers on Nate Herbig coming, and I'm going to DM them to you right now um, just to get you some of the signing bonus and some of the details on Herbig if you want to have a quick reaction uh, to, to the data there. Yeah, according to Aaron Wilson on Twitter, looks like, uh, okay, $2.92 million uh, signing bonus, base salaries in 2023 of $1.5 uh, oh eight zero, which, uh, I think is minimum. And then a $4 million base salary in 2000 and, uh, 24, his cap number in 2023 will be 2.54 million. His cap number in 2024 will be 5.46 million. This is an even cash split, meaning he'll earn $4 million in 2023. And four million dollars in two thousand and twenty-four. Okay, and I guess no roster bonus, nothing else. That's just a pretty simple deal. Yeah, yeah, just a, a pretty, pretty simple two-year split-up uh, contract here. If you if you have to cut him after this year, you got one point four six million dollars in dead money, and you would save four million dollar the four million dollars that you were that 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 you would have paid him in a base salary. All right. Good deal. Yeah. Pretty cheap overall for Nate Herbig. So apologize for interrupting our thoughts on Oaken Joby. We took a pause there just really briefly to kind of re-examine the numbers. So I forget exactly where you were at talking about Oaken Joby, but just to go back to, I guess, the money on him uh, and the value. And again, just goes back to him needing to stay healthy and be a bit more consistent. Uh, yeah. Once again, look, I, you know, you can, is even if we consider this an overpay, I mean, it's not the end of the world overpay uh, here. And but you know, once again, we'll have to see what the, how how the numbers shake out on this. Uh, they got painted a little bit into a corner here, I think. You know, and once again, I, I I wouldn't be shocked to hear that 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 there were a couple other teams in on this. Uh, you know, 
seven million versus nine and a half million. Yeah, there's a little bit of difference there, but you know, at least you know what you're getting there. You had you had to do something. Either it was going to be outside uh, guy brought in, or it was going to be re-signing uh, Ogan Joby, and mm-hmm. they did the they they did the latter. They, they they stuck with 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 the devil that they knew there, and you know you just want to see him be more consistent um, uh, moving forward. Hopefully, he stays healthy, able to practice a little bit more, doesn't have the toe issue or whatever, and and that kind. Of, he can play better. I mean, we we've seen as you mentioned, we've seen his highs. Mm-hmm. You know, so you just want to see more of those highs. And similar to the Patrick Peterson signing, this does not, in my mind, really prevent this team at all from drafting a defense alignment early, even as early as the first round, to be honest with you, because who's that number three that's going to rotate in to be that injury protection? I mean, you have Laudemok, who disappointed his second year. He offers something as a pa- as a pass rusher. DeMarvin Liao might be a multiple hat guy. He's not going to be that pure every down three tech. And so they're going to have to add here as well. No stack of considerations, too. So um, bringing back Ogan Joby is one step, but it is not the final step to rounding out this defensive line room. Right. I mean, right, they're, so they're, they're, they're definitely going to address this position in the draft still. Yeah, and maybe even in free agency with a nose tackle. I think I'd rather go sign a free agent nose tackle, spend a bit of money there as opposed to drafting one, especially if he's kind of more of a two down, early down run stuffer type. Uh, that'd be my preference. Okay. All right, so that's the Ogan Joby signing, and the last one to come in, not a signing in Pittsburgh, but a signing elsewhere, Robert Spillane going to the Las Vegas Raiders. That was not on my bingo card, Dave. Two years uh, worth up to $9 million. If you had to, and I think I even said this at one point uh, on a podcast or a live stream or something, that if I had to guess one stealer I was most confident <laughs> in returning, it was Robert Spillane. And I, I was pretty good at calling these things last year, Dave. This I year, was I suck. really I, good out of last year. Yeah, I have been miserable calling stuff this year. So I thought Spillane was almost a lock to return. Going to have more value in Pittsburgh than any than anywhere else. But nope, he is off to the Raiders. I'm batting more, uh, 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 more worse, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, worse than you are. Uh, I thought Cam Sutton would stay. I thought Spillane would stay. I thought Ogan Joby would go. You know, well, I was so, the same. I predicted. So we're we're both. It's okay. a race to the bottom on this. On this I, I thought you. I thought you had o- Ogan Joby going. I mean, staying. No, I had him going. I I, I was I was like fifty five forty five on it, but I said he was going to okay. go. All right. Uh, I think I had both Casey and Edmonds coming back, didn't I? Yeah, I had just Casey coming back, and so we'll see. Okay. Edmonds is our tiebreaker, I guess. Uh, look, you can't fault the man for chasing that that money. Uh, I w- I would have been upset if the Steelers would have gave him that kind of money. I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm uh, not sure what the Raiders' plan is here. Right, and and I we haven't seen the numbers on that other than to know it's an up to up to di- up up to nine million dollars. I think is all we know at this point, right? Yeah, something about four million. Did I see something like four million guaranteed, or was there something in that on on Spillane? But the up to, I don't know how much heavy yeah. lifting that that phrasing is doing there. Uh, look, he he was a from an attitude and effort and hard work and blue collar and yada quintessential Steelers, you know, o- overall, you know, I, you couldn't draw them up, you know, uh, attitude and work ethic and team guy and all like that. Uh, uh, obviously, uh, 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 much better player against a run than, uh, than he, than he was in passing situations, a uh, good special teamer overall. And all, you know, that that's, that's an area where you're probably going to miss him a little bit too, with special teams and obviously against teams that want to uh, run a big back up the middle on you there. Uh, is this the end of the world losing him? Well, <laughs> you're, you're in a word, no, but uh, you look at this uh, linebacker room right now, uh, miles Jack, uh, Mark Robinson, uh, Tay Crowder, and Chappelle Russell. Those are the four guys that you got under contract right now. And obviously, Miles Jack really is the only one that you know has seen considerable playing time because Robinson barely scratched the surface on the field. You obviously hope that you have something there. No, I take that back. Crater has played a little bit. Uh, Crowder yeah, has, uh, has, yeah. has played a little bit there, but uh, there's still a lot of questions about him, him, him moving forward. But uh, you, you better do something before the draft. You're still probably going to have to address this position in the draft now, mm-hmm. uh, but you better do something in the meantime. And it sounds like they at least attempted to, right? 
Right. Report came out from NFL Network's Shane Slater. Pittsburgh was in play on Leighton Vander Esch, who returned to Dallas on a two-year, $11 million deal. I just saw some of the framework of that contract. Pretty cheap, pretty good deal for, for Dallas's end of things. So Pittsburgh just didn't either want to pony up the money or Vander Esch maybe just wanted to return to Dallas and stay at home. I don't know what the case was there. So yes, yeah, Blaine's a bit like Ogan Joby. Ogan Joby is the better player, but the sense of Neither of those guys are irreplaceable, but if you lose them, then they have to get replaced because there's really not much else there right now. There is Jack, there is Robinson, but it's a really light looking room with Marcus Allen about the for agency. Same with Devin Bush. Bush, you know, could Devin Bush come back? I, I doubt that'll happen, but I guess it's a, a point now, at least now that Spillane is gone. But given the fact that Pittsburgh looked at a veteran like Van Der Esch, I imagine they're going to look at some other veteran and try to bring somebody in. Sean Evans comes to mind. We talked about that in the depot DM chat the last couple of days. Pittsburgh had a lot of interest in Evans whenever he came out of Alabama, had a bunch of tackles this past year with Atlanta and still relatively young. So it, this probably is going to be a you know mid to low tier free agent signing plus draft pick to round out that room. Right. Uh, I envision, you know, the Splane maybe coming back on, I don't know, max two years, six million or something like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and once again, we'll have to see what this up to amount is and how much of it you know, he obviously, it sounds like going to get at least 4 million guaranteed in that, probably whatever the base salary is and all like that. So probably a much better deal for him to take as far as putting instant money in his pocket and uh, that, that kind of thing there. So uh, I envision him coming back on a deal, at least on, you know, way it's being reported now, cheaper than that. Yeah. And as you said, you got to appreciate the story. Uh, und- undrafted guy was in Tennessee for a year, comes to Pittsburgh on the practice squad and just, you know, literally worked his way up the ladder from practice squad to getting on the 53 to getting the helmet to making an impact on special teams. Whenever he first came up the back half of, I think it was 2019, he was a dominant special teams guy. I mean, I think he led Pittsburgh in tackles on special teams throughout the year in eight games or, or something like that. And then became part of the rotation and always found a way to, to get defensive playing time, really became a three down linebacker last year. Now, he really shouldn't have been a three down linebacker. Pittsburgh putting him in dime packages the last two years, uh, not a good move. Um, and so they'll have to find a replacement there. But uh, there was a lot of trust in Robert Splane. They really trusted this guy to be a Simon Sound, to communicate. And when you lose him, when you lose Cam Sutton, who had those same qualities, trusted, good communicator, those things add up. And so obviously, you know, Spillane, not irreplaceable, but some of those intangibles are difficult to replace or at least replace immediately. Right. They, they, they better get busy working these phones now, at least get somebody back, back in the building, you know? Yeah. If it's not Evans, any other names you want to throw out there? I think someone mentioned uh, Tranquil. Yeah. I haven't really gone deep into why, you know, I, if, I would just, you know, I would be going off of, uh, off the cuff of just knowing a little bit about some of these other guys, as far as their actual tape goes. I mean, I got okay. some good ideas, but you know, but, uh, I mean, that list is just dwindled to these mm-hmm. two days. It started off a real long list of these guys. And once again, a lot of these guys is se- seemingly signed for reasonable money, you know? And now, I mean, you might have to start exploring the, the over 30 market. Yeah, some people have talked about Levante David. His team's going to go sign Patrick Peterson. But how old do you want your defense to be? A bunch of 30-year-old free agents coming in. I don't know if that's the plan in the course Pittsburgh wants to take across the board. So we'll see. I think some veteran gets brought in. I don't know who that's going to be. Evans makes sense, but we'll stay tuned. Right. All right, so any other final thoughts here on on these four moves here with Herbig, uh, Casey, Ogunjobi, Spillane, just your overall feeling on the day it was for the Pittsburgh Steelers. You feel better about the future of this team, worse about the same? Well, I tell you what, what I it, it's it's been a weird two days. I think for Omar Khan, I, I, I will say that uh, weird, and I guess weird from the uh, from the fact that, or at least in in my opinion, weird because I I didn't envision these two days looking anything like that. These two days have gone, you know. Uh, you had to do something once again. You had to do something with with uh, a defensive, you know, defensive lineman there. Either you go outside or you get Ogan Joby. Okay, they got Ogan Joby and they paid a paid a little bit more than than maybe we we you know we think is market value. Fine, no issue with that. Casey, uh, nothing wrong with that whatsoever. Uh, from what I've seen on Herbig, look. Th- how many times do we say this? This offense, that this team got lucky last year not having to dig into depth on that offensive line. Mm-hmm. Uh, however, this plays out 
with 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 her big uh which you would think now you hopefully going to be a starter uh at least you assuming you're going to keep Dotson, uh, you know, you got, you got some decent depth there, I think there. And that's something that they needed to do. And it still doesn't prevent you from, from addressing, you know, tackle during a draft at some point or, or even, you know, a center or maybe even another guard, depending on what you want to do. Uh, and, and this should put an end to Kendrick green, you know, uh, uh, for sure. I would think now, look, we don't know what any of the tenders are here. We are at, 1030 on a on the eve of the new new league year and we still don't know what this team is tendered restricted tendered uh and included in that list obviously is jc haas now you know so mm-hmm. uh but i mean no uh, uh, from what i've seen on tape and, and now looking at the contract there's nothing wrong with with the nate herbig signing and then what what else was there uh losing splain that's I mean, it's not the end of the world Right, it's not, but we'll see how they have to replace those guys. From a cap check-in standpoint, uh, it feels like they're right up against the cap. Dave, is that an accurate assessment? Yeah, look, a little over seven million going into into today. What's the differential going to be? I mean, you're not going to use but uh, one point six seven ish million on Herbig. We obviously let let's say uh, you 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 lose you use four and a half. Another th- let's say you use uh, displacement. I don't know, three point of uh, or four point two maybe displacement at max uh on on Ogan Joby. So what have I got us up to? Another say six million, five and a half, six million. We don't know what the KZ is. So I, I'm willing to bet they're they're razor thin at this point when it comes to cap space. So there's got to be a restructure coming, and they could cut somebody, but you think they would have done that already? Um, uh, I not, think restruct- so. not no. you know, look, last year they Last year they waited till Miles Jack was in the building and signed that deal before they turned uh, Joe Schobert loose. Yeah, but at some point if they're trading hands, they gotta they gotta make a move that just that just clears cap space, you know. Unless they sign somebody cheaper, then I guess. Uh, but then a who? I mean, who are they gonna sign? Like, what is that move gonna be this year? I, I'm just saying, I won't be shocked. I won't be shocked if uh, Witherspoon goes out the door. Okay, but then who will you sign? I'll just, leave, I'll just leave it at that. Okay, yeah, I guess I suppose we'll see. But I think but, at some but point, but they, you know, and they look, they might have restructures already done. Sure, and that, that's just the thing that clears up the most amount of cap space without cutting a player. Because even if you cut a Witherspoon, you save how much money there after displacement? The uh, three and a half, uh, three, 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 four minus what? Like eight? What's the bottom salary? Four million minus. Uh, I don't have it in front of me here. Okay, just call it around three point two five, three point two. Yeah, yeah. Like so, that. I mean, you don't have a lot of cap space at that point unless you're done for free agency and re-signings, which you, you but you aren't. Then I don't know right. how you're uh, getting through the rest of the off season by just cutting a color with a spoon. Right. So, uh, and, and once again, that they might have these restructures ready to go in tomorrow. You know. Yeah, so, I think you know, that would be Watt or Minka or both or something like that. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we'll we'll see. Look, I mean, it's going to be a busy day uh, of the paperwork shuffling by about four o'clock tomorrow. I think. Yeah, and you're seeing almost everything around the league restructure right now. The bills mm-hmm. just restructured, and so I think everyone's trying to do that last second thing to get fully because you got to be cap compliant by tomorrow officially. Correct. Right, right. And look, once again, it, it's not a matter of if they're going to restructure both of those guys. Really, it yeah. was just a matter of when. You know, would we see it uh, around the start of the new league year, or would it be, or maybe one of them by the start of the new league year, or both of them, or both of them later in the off season, that kind of thing. So it's never been a matter of will they. Mm-hmm. Uh, really, when I think it comes to both of them, it's just been a matter of when. When will it happen? You know. Sure, I think at least one's going to happen soon within the within a day or two is, is my guess, but we'll see. You know, I don't want to assume anything right now, and we'll see how Pittsburgh proceeds. Okay, but they are raised at least from what we know is out there right now. Once again, we don't know if they've tendered, but just what, you know, with, with the Ogan Joby, uh, Casey, Herbig deals, and we've got at least one piece of the puzzle with Herbig that we know, and we've got a partial piece of a puzzle really with, with Ogan Joby, knowing that that thing's going to look real similar to, to, to a core for, uh, we just don't know what the, what, what, what the Casey deal is, but e- either way, it's going to be razor close, uh, 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 against the cap with those three deals, whatever they end up being. 
One last note here on the news of the day, according to the Post-Gazette's Jerry Dulac, the Steelers apparently had some sort of offer made to Cam Sutton, but it was nothing near what the Lions were offering him at the three years, 11 million per year. So three years, 33 million. And so that's apparently the story on Sutton. We don't know exactly what Pittsburgh offered, but nothing in the ballpark of what he got. Yeah, uh, I guess not terribly surprising. I wonder what that number was. I'm guessing it's probably like eight and a half, nine million, something like that above Peterson, but not terribly high above Peterson. We'll never know. We can speculate until yeah. the cows come home. We'll never know. All right. Fair enough. But that was uh, the last note there on, on Cam Sutton. Tell, tell them about the Clemson Pro Day. Yeah. Just going to jump into that. Here's some draft talk here. Uh, Clemson Tigers, the first kind of big pro day of the pro day season. And as usual, as is clockwork, the Pittsburgh Steelers were, were uh, well attended with Mike Tomlin, Omar Khan, who else was there? Carl Dunbar, the D-line coach, although we didn't, I never saw him, but it was reported that, that he was there. Um, Dan Rooney Jr. was there. Dan Colbert was there. Danny Smith, can't forget about Danny Smith. He was there. So a very strong contingency at the Tigers Pro Day. And apparently, as expected, some Pro Day dinners uh, beforehand with Trent Simpson saying he had dinner. I believe Miles Murphy essentially said there was a dinner uh, with uh, with Tomlin and, and company as well. And I got to think that Brian Brisset was part of that dinner as well. Yeah, it, 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 you know, you would expect that they took more than one player out. You know, Mike Thomas is not afraid of that camera still. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, camera loves him. He loves the camera. Uh, he was all over the place there. And I would imagine the the the, uh, the Georgia uh, the Georgia pro day is is, is on uh, Wednesday. Uh, it's not that far of a drive. So I, I would expect uh, those, those guys and who knows, maybe even a couple more will be at the Georgia pro day. And oh yeah, it'll be a Georgia. And you have other pro day uh, sightings today too, right? Working on it. It's been tough this year. Tough start out of the gate. But uh, Pat Meyer, Steelers offensive line coach, was up at North West Western to watch Peter Skaronski. Uh, Mark Zadowski reportedly there as well. They had Chris Watts, an area scout at Louisiana Tech. A couple of cornerbacks there, late round guy Miles Brooks to check out. But Meyer up there for Skaronski. You know, obviously the, the history says he won't be the first round pick just because of Tomlin slash Khan not being there. But certainly notable when a positional coach goes up there to watch one of those guys. Maybe that's just one of those things. If if this guy falls, you know. Yeah. Um, but the history is the history. I mean, you know, right. they really now could they potentially bring him in for a visit? You know, you could try to do that because they weren't good. Whenever Tomlin and, and, and their and or Connor Cobert went goes to pro days, they're going there to watch a lot of people. It's rarely do they go just to watch one prospect where there's like one guy there and really nobody else. And so Clemson obviously had a bunch more guys than what Northwestern had. So it's no surprise to see them go to Clemson. But I think at the least, if you want to have a serious discussion about Skaronsky, you got to think he'd have to get brought in for a top 30. Okay. All right. And who then else, still who else on, have you spotted? Still working on the uh, rest they had. They had somebody at Oregon State. I'm guessing Mark Bruner. I can't confirm. Uh, Rajon Wright, one of the corners, said that they uh, had a meeting with, with Pittsburgh. Um, from there, they were at South Carolina. They were at Illinois. Again, I don't know who really had a tough time trying to identify those names. Uh, but they have been spotted. I, I don't believe that Grady Brown, the DB's coach, was at South Carolina. I saw a listing of the DB coaches who were there. Brown was not part of that list. And so unless he was missed, I don't believe he was there, which I'm a little surprised and disappointed by that they would have had interest in those top corners there in Cam Smith and Darius Rush. Uh, I looked at uh, what little I could find on on Oregon. I, I didn't see Grady there either. Okay. Yeah. Again, that's probably not saying he, well, he wasn't, but. You know, uh, of course, uh, Christian uh, uh, Gonzalez, Gonzalez was there. you know, yeah. they're, they're going through the drills and all like that. So not saying he wasn't there, just in the little, little, maybe there'll be more video out tomorrow of that. Yeah, I know the coach that put Gonzalez through drills was not Grady Brown. And so right. I'll have to see if I can find anybody else. It was not a super popular pro day. There were no GMs, no head coaches there. I think Gerard Mayo was the biggest name in attendance. So Again, not expecting Gonzalez to be there at 17, and so it kind of might be a moot point. But we'll try to redouble efforts and uh, see if we can find some of these scouts. All right. Uh, what else is left to report? Anything? I think that's about everything. I should note, by the way, didn't mention this in the last podcast, the projection is fourth-round comp pick for Cam Sutton, according to Nick Corte. And so obviously this thing can change based on who's resigned and all those types of things. But um, if you're looking with a – a very long lens to the future, maybe about this time next year, Pittsburgh will uh, get a comp pick for Cameron Sutton. 
Yeah, we just have to let this play out, you know, and, and, and see what happens the rest of the way here. I, I haven't even looked looked at that. Has he updated his uh, tracking on, on, on over the cap? Um, I just saw Corte tweet about it saying, yeah, you shouldn't say fourth round comp pick, but like fourth round comp value, value that could right. be canceled out by, you know, I don't know how the Herbig deal is going to, it shouldn't, that shouldn't impact it. I don't, I don't think, but fourth round value for Sutton, I should probably clarify. Uh, it looked like he's got, oh, oh, you said, uh, no, it looks like, uh, Peterson cancels out Sutton. Oh, okay. Does he cancel him out? I wasn't yeah, sure how they yeah. do some of the, I, over I, thought I, type I, thing. I thought I saw something on that. Yeah. He's got Peterson canceling out Sutton on the fourth rounder. And he does have right now her big gaining a, a six round value. Okay. So Pittsburgh may not get that comp pick next year then. So we'll have to see what else they lose and what else they gain. So uh, bottom of the bottom of the uh, fourth inning, uh, Steeders got a uh, six round comp pick value on the board. How's that? All right. Sounds good. So yeah, a lot, a lot, lot, a lot of things can change here. So um, don't want to get too hyper focused on that. Any other thoughts here, Dave? Anything we're missing here? No, and uh, you know, we're we're not going to touch any email. We're doing these late at night. We're trying to do them every day and all like that. So we're, we're trying to keep them as short as possible. So keep your email questions coming in. And what, once we get past this busier time of of free agency, we'll start diving back into the email box a little bit more. So if there's not anything else, uh, Alex, I'll close this out. Uh, You can follow me on Twitter at Steeders Depot. Follow Alex Kazora on Twitter at Alex underscore Kazora. Follow the show at Terrible Podcast. Email the show, theterriblepodcast at gmail.com. If you like what we do and want to donate to the cause, SteedersDepot.com, hit the donate button up right navigation bar. Also, if you like an ad-free version of the site, SteedersDepot.com, hit the ad-free button up right navigation bar tremendous traffic again today uh we're gonna it looks like we're gonna top uh yesterday so we appreciate everybody's support uh on the site uh and all the hard work that all the contributors are doing on steeders depot uh, uh, com as well too so who knows maybe we'll be back tomorrow uh, you know if there's something that, that, that really needs discussing we'll we'll fire up the podcast machine for that so in the meantime as always thanks for listening to the terrible podcast with dave and alex 